Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. There's two economic doctrines that in my mind have caused more harm than any others. One is Marxism and the other is Keynesianism. So I got a guest on today who's going to explain Keynesianism to us. He is an assistant professor of economics and finance at Bryan College and an associated scholar at the Mises Institute. Jonathan Newman, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on. All right. So first of all, who was John Maynard Keynes? Well, John Maynard Keynes was an economist uh, uh, who was very popular in the early 20th century. Uh, he he sort of um, spawned a, a, a revolution in economic thinking uh, that was based on a rejection of some of the fundamental principles of, of classical economics and uh, the, really the economics of, of the day. And the, the the main rejection, the main thing that he he denied to when he was setting out his own economic framework was uh, the idea of Say's law, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but to to just give people who might not be familiar with what Keynesianism is, uh, a lot of it is associated with uh, modern uh, economic uh, policy making, and so if. If you hear people talk about a stimulus package, or if you hear people talk about the benefits of expansionary monetary policy because it will uh, kickstart spending in the in the macro economy, and all of this spending will generate economic activity and growth and get us out of recessions and that sort of thing, that's all Keynesian thinking. the The idea that spending is what drives the economy. So. Uh, Often the uh, policy prescriptions have to do with expanding government spending or monetary policy, as I mentioned, that is uh, intended to to just get consumption spending and investment spending uh, really as big as it can as it can get. And the reason why is because Keynesians view depressions as uh, a really it's a problem with demand. It's a problem with there's not enough people spending money, uh, which which is very different than the way that I and the in the Austrian School of Economics views depression. But since they view the, the problem as a lack of spending, it means that the answer for them is going to be a big dose of of spending uh, wherever it can come from. So that that's a Keynesianism in a nutshell, sort of gave the the punchline, which is the policy prescription um, at the outset. But that's really what they're they're most famous for. OK, you mentioned Say's Law, that, of course, well, I don't know about, of course, but named after the French economist John Baptiste Say. What was or what is Say's Law of Markets? Say's Law, uh, there's been a lot of debate uh, about what Say's Law is and what it means, uh, and not not just those things, but whether it's true. Um, I, I'm i a believer in Say's Law, um, and not on like religious grounds, but I, I think it's I think it's incontrovertible. I think the logic of it is, is very sound. Say's law uh, simply means that we can't have a general glut. It means that we there's no such thing as a problem of too much stuff on the market. There, there's too much um, inventory, too much uh, consumption goods out there uh, available to be sold and, and not enough demand. Uh, and, and so uh, one way to think about it is that if somebody uh, produces and sells something on the market, it means that they've acquired some income by selling that thing. So suppose I suppose I, I uh, own and, uh, and run a coffee shop. And so I combine factors of production like coffee beans and coffee makers, and I hire some labor and I have my little store. So I spend all that money and I, I produce some coffee and then a consumer comes and purchases the coffee from me. When the consumer purchases that coffee from me, that's income for me and it's spending for the consumer. So the so the consumer has just spent money and it's my income. That income that I receive by selling the coffee now enables me to go buy other things on the market. So I can take that money that I get by selling things and then I can go demand whatever I want from the market, something that somebody else has produced. And so what that means is that there can never be a general and persistent mismatch in supply and demand, like overall. And, and the reason why is because whenever somebody supplies something on the market, it enables their their demand for other things on the market. So so overall supply and overall demand have to be equal to each other. Right. Now, so, so, so go ahead. So in reality, right, the only thing that you can possibly demand something with is supply. Otherwise, you you have nothing. Now, money, of course, 
complicates the matter because it's a means of exchange. But if we imagine a barter economy, if I want to go buy, say, three horses from you, I've got to bring some supply of my own goods. So, so that's what I'm actually doing is trading my supply for yours. So supply and demand are actually equal, correct? Right. And actually the simplest way to think about it is to think about a Crusoe economy. So if you think about one person in isolation, what, what says law means is that production must precede consumption. It means that we have to produce things before we can consume things, that everything that we possibly consume must have been produced first. That, that's that's really in a nutshell. If you take things down to the fundamental uh, level, that's what says law means. It means that in order for us to consume anything it, and in like a money using economy or even a barter economy, we could think about that as demand. In order for us to demand anything, there must have been production first. Now, uh, so the reason why this is a, a good starting point when talking about Keynes is because Keynes started off his general theory by saying that says law is wrong. He's, he said, well, first of all, he he uh, messed it up. He, he got it wrong. And then he said that version that he said it, it, um, is wrong. And he used that as a starting point for constructing his whole uh, framework. But the way Keynes said it was that supply creates its own demand. That, that's what he said. And of course, like if you phrase it that way, then obviously you can immediately start poking some holes in that sure. because, because it's not, it's not based on generals. It's not based on, uh, it's not based on the, the fundamental logic that production must precede consumption. And so if you say supply creates its own demand, that sort of sounds like if I just produce anything, then somebody will demand it. That like anything that right. is produced will have demand, which is not says law at all. So uh, of course, entrepreneurs can produce things where there's no demand for it. But like so, it could be that uh, to go back to my coffee shop example, it could be that I produce coffee, but s suppose I I uh, brew it in such a way that people don't like it. I mean, and so I just suffer losses. So nobody ever buys the coffee that I, I produce, and so I suffer losses as, as an entrepreneur. So. So obviously that's not what says law means. Says law does not mean that supply creates its own demand. What all it means is that in general, so if we look at uh, supply in general and demand in general, there can't be a an overall mismatch. And the reason why is like I said, when somebody demands something, it means that there was supply first. Right. So when Keynes says supply creates its own demand, it implies that supply creates demand for itself. But in reality, the supply of one thing is what creates demand for another. And Keynes also neglected to say, from my understanding, that Say's law assumes equilibrium. It's essentially a, a mental tool that assumes there's a correct match between, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, between what people want and, and, and what is produced. It doesn't... Uh, uh, factor in malinvestments, right? So, but if we have, tell me if this is wrong. I've uh, George Reisman actually wrote this. And I read it years ago that if you have overproduction of one thing, it implies underproduction of something else because you've misdirected resources. So you don't have, you can never have a general overproduction. You can only have malinvestment or overproduction of some goods at the expense of underproduction of other goods. Is, the, is yeah. that accurate? Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think uh, the, the only way that we can think about there being overproduction of something, it means that factors of production were allocated towards the production of that thing and taken away from the production of other things. And, and that means that we didn't get enough of the other thing. So so we can only speak about it in relative terms. But like you said, says law is in it's in general terms. It's about all goods and services, which means that there's no way that we could ever conceive of a problem of of overproduction because that would mean that there's there would have to be underproduction somewhere else but there is there isn't a somewhere else when you're talking about the economy in general so yeah i think that's a good way to think about it all right so what is kane's critique i mean i understand so kane says overproduction is possible but why does he say that how does he arrive at that conclusion i mean other i i mean in the general theory of employment interest and money he puts together all kinds of equations and if you know this equals this and you know and all that stuff but it he doesn't really explain how it could ever occur not in to my satisfaction anyway 
Yeah, well, you're right. It's not a, it's not a very satisfying rejection. I think I think what's going on is Keynes and Keynesians they they look at they look at the business cycle and they diagnose it as a general glut. They they say, oh, there's just not enough demand for the things that have been produced. If if consumers would just go out and buy the things that have been produced, that would solve all the problems. That would get employment back up. That would uh, that would get uh, all the inventory off the shelves. People would have uh, greater income. So really, there's just like the, they diagnose the the problem as there's not enough spending going on, and so. And so if if that's the way that you diagnose the problem or the way you diagnose a depression, well then then you're gonna say, well, hmm, maybe maybe state's law isn't right. Maybe, maybe we can have general gluts. Maybe there there can be like an overall problem with demand. So I think I think the uh, the rejection of it is based on on empirical grounds. So like they they make these observations and it what well, one thing that like you certainly could look at a depression and concludes like, hmm, it seems like something's off here about the macro economy, about things in general. And so I think they use that as a basis for uh, rejecting Say's law. It's it's like they they recognize the scene, but don't acknowledge the unseen. So mm -hmm. they can see there's all these goods that aren't being purchased. What they're not seeing are the goods that should have been produced because they didn't happen. But theoretically they could have happened and if they did then the depression wouldn't follow right so yeah you're right they they're really just looking at what is seen and they, they don't contemplate the the uh like what's going on under the hood like you said uh or, or you didn't say that but you said the unseen and like it's it's you have to take a closer look at what's happening in the economy to, to properly diagnose it so so one one thing that Austrian economists do along those lines is they disaggregate production. Uh, so we we don't just look at production in general and uh, consumption in general or big big aggregate totals of spending in general. What we look at is we we look at production as happening in time. We 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 see that production takes time. Like you have to start with natural resources. You have to create some capital goods. You've got to employ workers along the way. You've got to bring in some more intermediate products. And then eventually you end up with a consumption good. And, and what this does is it it uh, it shows you that interest rates matter. It, it shows you that, that production is a time-taking and time-sensitive uh, endeavor. And so what that means is there, there, there are going to be issues when you try to fiddle with interest rates, when you try to... Uh, stimulate the economy, especially with with monetary policy, it's going to cause all these entrepreneurs to make different decisions than they otherwise would have been. So, or yeah, to mention the unseen, like like you said. So, and the particular sorts of issues that arise is that producers start to undertake riskier projects, longer projects uh, than they otherwise would have if if there's a bunch of new credit on the scene coming from central banks or the fractional reserve banking system. So if there's if there's this big expansion of credit, it induces entrepreneurs to to start all these projects, to to make the wrong things, and they start sure. they start lines of production that won't eventually pan out, um, pre precisely because we actually don't have the real savings set aside to finish them. And so that that's how Austrian economists diagnose at least the boom period is that all of these projects are starting, but they're they're they are not completable. It's like we we actually don't have all the capital goods available to finish the production projects that are started during the artificial boom. And, and just to go back to where I started, that can only happen, or you can only diagnose that if you have a proper understanding of production happening in time yeah. and, a pro and a proper understanding of what capital goods are and capital specificity and, and all of those sorts of things. So the, the difference then between what Keynes sees and what the Austrians see Keynes sees a depression and assumes there's been a general overproduction of, of goods. And he assumes that's just a function of the free market. It's what inevitably happens. There's going to be in a free market an excessive production of some goods. The Austrians say, no, it's not a general overproduction. What you have is a misallocation of goods or, or a misallocation of investment, but they also provide the explanation. And the explanation is rooted in the idea that interest rates are originary interest, the, the fundamental part of the interest rate is generated by time preference that all mm -hmm. things remaining equal people prefer present goods to future goods and what ends up happening is so if, if there's very low interest rates it tells the the entrepreneurs that 
people are saving, that people have a low time preference at this point. They want to they want to consume in the future. So then the entrepreneurs mistakenly invest in future in, in projects to produce first uh, to produce future goods. But there's not actually the demand for those things. And that's how you get the malinvestment, the appearance of overproduction. And then when there's no demand for it, you see the subsequent depression, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the that the Keynesians blamed the free market. So Keynes uh, talked about this idea called the animal spirits. And even though he's really famous for it, it's actually like in one paragraph of his uh, his book, The General Theory. Uh, but but the idea that that he got started there was that uh, investment spending and and really other uh, components of the economy are guided by like these animalistic urges. Like we just have investors as a class have a bunch of optimism, and so they go invest and they and they pour a bunch of money into the stock market, and then they get pessimistic, and so they draw back. And when they draw back. That uh, that is what triggers the recession. That's what triggers the the bust and the sell off. And so, and so it's it's really sort of like a crude way of thinking about economics because in economics, like we always like we think about choices that people are making uh, in, in a way that that has to do with with like future planning and I'm trying to economize my, my resources. So I have all of these like, like motivations for arranging my economic life in a certain way. And, and so in order for Keynes to explain like where the bust comes from, he had to resort to these, it's like all of a the sudden there's just this broad pessimism that comes from nowhere and that's what causes the business cycle. So it's very, it's a very different way of, of approaching economics in general, not, not just the, the subject of uh, business cycles. So Keynes attributes a lot of this to what's, what he calls the consumption function that the more money people make, the more they're going to save, not just in real dollars, but I believe he actually says it's a higher percentage of their income that they're going to save. That saving means that money is not being spent. And that's what leads to an insufficient demand or excessive supply, two sides of the same coin. He essentially assumes that this money when people save is being hoarded, right? What's wrong with that idea? Yeah. So, Keynes called it the paradox of thrift. And the idea is that while he, he acknowledges that saving can be rational, it can be a good idea for individuals or households. So like people save so that they can uh, be better prepared for the uncertain future. So, so he says that, yeah, that's fine. But what they're doing when households increase their savings, they're restricting their demand for goods and services. So, like if I if I increase how much I'm how much I'm saving, that means I have to decrease how much I'm spending. And as we've been discussing, if if everybody decides to increase their savings and restrict their spending, then that's going to cause losses for like retail firms, and then that's going to trickle back into uh, reduced demand for workers. And then we have a big increase in unemployment. So the, the paradox is that what might be a good idea for individual households is actually bad collectively. It's bad for the macro economy. And, and it's simply because it causes a restriction of spending that that turns into a, a, a restriction of, of demand for all, all factors of production, which reduces incomes. And by the way, you mentioned the consumption function. If there's a reduction in income, then that means that there's going to be another reduction in consumption spending. So, so really, Keynes has this framework. He has this way of thinking about the economy that's very fragile because any sort of sudden decrease in, in spending turns into a reduction in income, which turns into another reduction in spending. And so the, the economy just spirals down into depression in, in the Keynesian view. And there's really, there's really nothing that can bring it out of, of that spiraling downward into depression uh, process except for... The government is except for the government deciding, hey, we are above and beyond all of these animal spirits. We can decide to increase spending when nobody else will. And that will get us back to the full employment level of of income and spending. So is Keynes wrong? One, that the more uh, that the more money people make, the higher percentage of their income they save. And two, that when they do save, it amounts to hoarding. And that's what shrinks the economy. Or all, yeah, I, or so creates over, I, uh, excess demand. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I would supply. I would dispute both of that. So I I don't think that saving is bad. I think that voluntary savings is a good thing. That that uh, uh, that's what enables capital accumulation and future economic growth. 
So really, really the engine of economic growth is not spending. The engine of economic growth is is prior savings. So first you have to save, and then you can use those savings to to extend production in a sustainable way, and and make more capital goods, and you're more prepared for the future. And and since you've set aside those resources for production, that actually does increase productivity today. So I so I think like voluntary savings is actually the most healthy thing that a, that an economy can do. So, so I dispute it on those grounds, but also, like you said, I, I dispute the whole consumption function idea. Uh, the idea that, that we can uh, like mechanically relate income to levels of consumption and levels of saving. I don't think that's, I don't think that's true. There's, there's no, there's no constant relationship between income and consumption. There's no constant relationship between income and saving. Uh, it's, it's, that's a separate decision that households make. So, and it's not, while it might be related to income, we could imagine that it's, it's very easy for households to change their consumption and saving uh, ratio, their, their, their decision to do both independent of a change in income. So like my income could stay exactly the same, but I could certainly decide to save more or consume more. Um, but obviously those exist in a trade-off. So the idea that, that those are, are uh, tied in a mechanical way to the level of, of income is also just, I, I think, I don't think that that's a very useful or like correct way to think about uh, how, how people in the economy are making decisions. Okay. So there's been in, in Kane's view now there, there's been an excess of production. So there's an excess supply. People aren't buying it, so prices begin to drop. And then what are, are some of the solutions that Keynes offers to this? Well, you said prices begin to drop. And while, while that's true, some, some prices will begin to drop. A really another key part of the Keynesian story is that not all prices drop. So they they hold to this idea called sticky prices and especially sticky wages. So so there's this reduction in uh in spending but then wages for whatever reason are are stuck artificially high so even though there's a decreased demand for labor you would expect wages to come down can you say that because of sticky wages it means that we have a mismatch in the labor market it means that we have quantity supply um, exceeding quantity demanded and so that that actually causes even more unemployment so there's more unemployment um businesses can't attract the, the factors of production, especially the labor that they need to, to, to increase production. Um, and, and so there, there's another, like I said, there's another spiraling downward sort of process there because, because wages are stuck artificially high. And, and I, I put artificially in quotes because it's, it's really unclear what, what that means or, or what that, or what's causing that. So, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, lately. Uh, obviously, I would say that if we have minimum wage legislation, then that can that can cause a wage to be stuck artificially high because because both workers and employers would like for would like to contract at a lower wage. But if if we have minimum wage legislation, then that would prevent that from happening. That would mm -hmm. prevent that market from clearing. But a lot of the the rationale that I hear given for sticky wages actually has to do with the worker psychology or even the employer's um, strategy. So, like one one example is uh, th they say that workers are uh, they're really concerned with their nominal wages. So even if their real wage would stay the same or increase, they don't want to take a nominal pay cut. And and what what they're doing when you phrase it that way, you're actually referring to workers' own preferences which means that the labor supply curve would already ha have taken that into account. So if you don't see wages dropping, it means that the labor supply curve is just more elastic. <laughs> I'm sorry if this is like getting more technical than, than your listeners might want, but, but basically what it means is that you're, you're saying that there's something wrong with labor markets, but it's actually working just fine. There, there's not a problem. There's not a, there's not a, a disequilibrium being caused by a drop in labor demand. Anyway, back to your original point. If if uh, prices are dropping, uh, but wages aren't, then that causes all sorts of unemployment. And and what it means is that we we need something outside of the market to fix it, since there's nothing inherent in the market that would fix itself. Because you remember, uh, Keynes had this animal spirits idea. So there's there, there's nothing within the market that would 
that would be motivated to fix the problems, it means that we need something outside the market to fix the problems. And so they look to government. And primarily, they look to government uh, in terms of like fiscal policies. So we need the government to increase a lot of spending, uh, so so that spending in general will increase. That will increase the demand, at least the nominal demand for factors, and then we get rid of the sticky wages problem, and just the overall aggregate demand increases. So, so their their solution to any sort of deflation, any sort of depression, is well, we need to get. We need to get the inflation back. We need to get the um, we need to get the total aggregate demand back to to fix the problem. Okay, so the, the Keynes solution then is when people aren't buying stuff, have the government step in, basically put the money into the economy so that stuff ends up getting bought. Has this been well? When has this been tried? The, oh. <laughs> this this Keynesian solution. Yeah, just in the United a, States. I mean, I know it's a worldwide thing, but just in the United States, when has it been? Tried? Yeah, th this has been tried basically with every recession and depression and business cycle uh, ever. So, I mean, even if you go back to the Great Depression, how did FDR respond? Well, he had huge government programs. He he was trying to uh, uh, fix wages. He was trying to fix prices. He was uh, he had huge government spending programs like just a massive increase in the size and scope of government. Um, and so, so that was, a, I mean, that's a very Keynesian way to respond. Um, if you, if we look at more recent business cycles, like if you look at 2008, how, how did uh, Obama respond uh, in Congress? It's not just the executive and, and they responded with, with the same sort of huge increases in government spending, big stimulus package uh, checks going out to everybody lots of infrastructure spending. So it's really, it's, um, th this, this is why we see huge increases in government during these economic crises. It's because they're re responding in a Keynesian way. Okay. Now you said the, the great depression, they implemented these Keynesian policies and, and they've done it since, but we had depressions before the great depression. Mm -hmm. So how ha does it compare in terms of economic recovery with and without the Keynesian solutions. In other words, the, the depression, I think it was 20 to 21 or 21, 21 to 22. I don't know. It was with Warren Harding, that depression compared to the, the great depression or, or to the Obama re recession, the great recession. How does it compare when the government doesn't interfere and when they do? It, it's a great question. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that uh, 1920, 1921 depression, because that's actually uh, sometimes called uh, famously the the forgotten depression, and there's a great book by uh, Jim Grant on on that, and and the answer is we the depression basically fix, fixes itself in in short manner. Uh, so if we just allow the correction to happen on its own, if we allow markets to heal on their own, and and let entrepreneurs find profitable and productive uses for factors of production. Then we have we have a short and, and sometimes painful crisis, but it we don't get a long drawn out depression. And so I think I think it's really um, it's really telling. I think the empirics really match up well with, with this with the Austrian way of thinking about it. That that if you try to delay the correction phase, if you try to delay and hamper the the recession period, then all, all you're going to do is just make matters worse. However, if you just step, step back and do nothing, if the government just doesn't do anything at all, then, then we, we get the correction that we need. We get, we get factors going in, into productive lines and, and the re recession and depression is over quickly. So Keynes contradicts classical economics. He, he contradicts neoclassical economic contradicts the Austrians. <laughs> He doesn't make a very strong case. It's very convoluted. Even his student, Paul Samuelson, says this book is, you know, you, you can't make any sense of it, basically. <laughs> and now we've had, I think it was written in 37. So we've had, you know, 80 some odd years of, of practice. Maybe it was later than that. But it, regardless, it, it, we've had a long time. And, it, and it's not showing to be work. So what explains the grip that Keynesian economics has both on the economics profession and government policy? So I think I have a very cynical answer to that. And my answer is that I think it's popular because it gives government 
a blank check to to expand in a crisis. So I think the reason why it's it's been adopted in in the halls of government is because it gives them backing for doing whatever they want to for for expanding uh, hugely in size and scope whenever there's a recession. And and I think I think that's the answer. So you're absolutely right that even even Keynesians look back at Keynes's general theory and they're like this. It's very vague. It's uh, it's contradictory. It's it's like self contradictory in on a number of occasions, and I think I think Keynes was he just had this sort of like a slippery way with words where he he wouldn't want to commit in one direction, and so he would say one thing and then the total opposite on the next page. So I I do I definitely see where that Samuelson quote is coming from. That it's really hard to pin Keynes down on on certain things. Of course, his overall framework is clear that, you know, government spending is, is the cure for any sort of problem that's ailing the economy. But but yeah, my, my answer to the question about why is this, if that's the case, then why is it popular? It, I think it's because politicians like it. It, it gives them um, all sorts of leeway to do whatever they want. But that doesn't explain its hold on academia. That's where I, I, I that I, I find maddening. Like, so, I don't... I don't get why it, it takes such a hold there. Yeah, I think I have a cynical answer for that as well. I think that if something is popular with government, then it's going to be popular with academia. So I don't I don't have a very uh, rosy view of of academia. I think if if a huge employer of academics is the government, like through uh, like state schools, and I think the Federal Reserve has like twenty three thousand workers or something like that. So if that's who's hiring and they they want to get the answers that they want to hear, which is give me permission to to spend as much as I want to and tax as much as I want to and and do all the government projects that I want to so that I can get reelected. If though if that's the people who are hiring all these academics, then you can imagine what sort of effect that's going to have on academia. So uh, Rothbard talked a lot about this um, uh, in some of his later work, just just how beholden academia is to the government and so we we shouldn't uh, we should we should have our critical thinking caps on even when we're looking at the the so-called expert class and i don't think it's very controversial to say that that academics can be swayed one direction or another that they're not uh, that they're not somehow immune to the the sorts of incentives that that they say um applies to everybody else. So the supply of government money creates the demand for Keynesian economics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, economics. That's, a good, that's a good way of putting right. it. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a little bit about the Austrian school and, and I, I've been strongly influenced by the Austrian school myself, particularly Mises. What do you think the prospects are? I mean, I, I've been hearing about for a long time, the Austrian resurgence or the, you know, the Austrian comeback. But I don't really see it aside from hearing it. What do you think the prospects are for Austrian economics to to gain a foothold? In, well, in I think uh, I I think uh, a lot of it is counter cyclical. So we saw, well, actually, I'll go even a few uh, decades earlier. We saw a big resurgence in interest in Austrian ideas in the 1970s. And I think it's because the Keynesian paradigm was uh, being severely questioned because we had what's called stagflation. We, uh, so one uh, implication of of Keynesian of the Keynesian framework is that there should be this short run trade off between inflation and unemployment. It's often called the the short run Phillips curve, and that broke down in the 1970s. And and it was it was so obvious that academics broadly had to do this sort of like reckoning, like how do I reconcile. Uh, the Keynesian framework with what we're observing with inflation and unemployment. So inflation was surging in the 70s, and so was unemployment. <clears throat> and so a lot of people were like looking around for answers in that, and the, there was a big resurgence in interest in, in Austrian ideas in the 70s because of that. Um, and another example is after the 2008 crash. So that was when we had the Ron Paul revolution. And I, and I think it's because people were looking around and saying, what? It seems like all the all the low interest rates of of the two thousands caused this housing bubble. Who 
who explained it, who predicted it, who, uh, who has the best explanation for what I'm seeing. And so there was a big resurgence in interest in Austrian ideas there as well. So I'm, it's a little bit um, a sort of a pessimistic way of looking at things, but I think that the, the, the more we see crises and the more we see uh, government messing up, I, I do see that there's a big resurgence in interest in Austrian ideas when that happens. So what that means is we shouldn't expect to see just like this stable increase in numbers uh, or, or we shouldn't see like uh, just an out of nowhere explosion in interest. I think what's got to happen is there's got to be some crisis that wakes people up and and that's where they turn to places like Mises.org, LouRockwell.com, those sorts of places where where they see they see the answers or uh, yeah, they see good explanations for the things that they're observing. Um, with, with that said, I, I definitely do see uh, just in my lifetime, there's been a huge increase in, in interest in, in Austrian ideas. Uh, so I, I started uh, looking at this stuff. I was actually a part of the, the whole 2008 response. So that, that's what got me interested in trying to ex explain what's going on. Where is this recession coming from? Where, where did the crisis come from? And I ended up reading Henry Hazlitt's Economic in One Lesson. Um, and I went to Mises Institute events and, you know, here I am now. So I, I think uh, it, just in my lifetime, there's been a huge resurgence in interest. And I, I see this even among my like college friends. So, so, and it's not just because of my influence. It, like we were all sort of like looking at Austrian ideas at the same time independently. It wasn't because like I was some sort of uh, like ringleader there. So I, I think it's there. It might be in pockets. And I definitely think that we'll see more of it as as we see more crises coming. So I, what that means is I have like a, a both an optimistic and a pessimistic view of crises. So on the one hand, it's bad because that usually gives government leeway to expand a lot. Um, but also, I think it's a good uh, occasion for Austrians to to reach out and show people, hey, this is this is where the crisis came from. And it's a really, it, it, in that sense, it's it's a good time to to just explain Austrian ideas to people. You know, it's interesting to me that you brought up 2008 because my hope was at that time that people would see that if Obama got elected, people were going to see how horrible this was and they may turn to a free market. But what ended up happening, a large amount of people turned populist. And, you know, we saw the the uh, insurgence of Donald Trump, the election of Donald Trump, call for tariffs, restriction on immigration. It just it, it seems like the, the problem is constantly being misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we, do you see that out there? So I don't, I don't really have a, a lot of opinions on that, except except to say. So like since I'm such a, a strong believer in Austrian ideas, I I view populism as a as a strategy or at least as one channel for us to get to make our ideas more popular. So so if people are fed up with with the Federal Reserve and they're they're sort of suspicious of that, then why not ride a populist wave that's that's anti-central bank? Um or if we if we see that people are you know sick of paying taxes, then why not latch on to that and show people, well, hey, have you really considered what the state actually is and, and you know point them to anatomy of the state by Murray Rothbard so so I, I view populism uh as not necessarily a bad thing but it's it's just one channel by which we can uh um show people our ideas all right before I let you go you just mentioned anatomy of state by Murray Rothbard and Rothbard's economics I find to be superb Mm -hmm. he, he's he, he, uh, puts an Aristotelian spin on Mises, which I, I think is f phenomenal. I just wonder what's your thoughts on the, the Austrian school of economics is one thing, but then there's also the sort of anarcho-capitalist wing of the Austrians. Do you think, in my view, that's unfortunate. I don't know. I haven't asked you what your view is. I have no idea. But do you think that that is problematic for Austrian ideas? Regardless of the rightness or wrongness of it, I, like I said, I think it's wrong, but I, that, that's too much of a debate. I just wonder, does that harm if somebody is investigating Austrian ideas, for instance, and they come across Rothbard's for a new liberty, li, for a new liberty, where essentially he wants the, the abolition of the state and competing governments. Do you think that that 
repels people? Does it attract people or does it just have no, no effect at all? Well, um, that's, that's a good question. And it's, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I, I mean, it, it wasn't a repellent for me. So I, I was sort of just like an apathetic neocon, uh, in like the mid two thousands, I was a college student, so I didn't really have well-formed political ideas at all. Uh, but like, I, I took the, uh, a, a very well-traveled path, which was I saw Ron Paul in the debates and I saw that he was saying something different. And so I investigated further, did some more reading and like through that pathway, it, it sort of took me to, to the whole idea of Austro uh, of Austro libertarianism. And, um, I, 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 I really don't get into all the political discussions as much. I try to focus on the, on the economics, but I mean, at least for me, it wasn't repellent. I, I can't really speak for everybody else. I, I do know that some people like they, they try to stay away from the A word. They try to stay away from uh, anarchism. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I approach it sort of like as a scholar. It's like, it's a set of ideas that could either be right or wrong. It's not, it's not something that, uh, that puts like a bad taste in my mouth, you know? All right. Well, Jonathan Newman, thank you very much for being here. You've done a great job explaining a very complex topic to us. Is there some place that people can find you? Yeah. So at, at the beginning, you introduced me as a, as an assistant professor at a Bryan College. I'm actually not there uh, any longer. Oh, I got bad the, info. Uh, oh man. Oh no, it's it's fine. Uh, um, it's it's pretty recent. So I'm full time at the Mises Institute now. Okay. And, uh, so people can find me um, at uh, Mises.org. The the we have uh, the wire. Uh, blog and and I write stuff uh, uh, for that pretty frequently. I'm also on Twitter and I'm pretty active. My my uh, username is uh, Newman J underscore R. So look forward to to seeing you guys there. Thanks for having me on, Michael. All right, awesome. All right, for now this is the Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz signing out. Remember, like, share, comment, subscribe. Till next time.